Okay, I know it's been a while, but we are back. Um, we are back in Echo. This is part two of Echo, and we are in chapter 12. And you should have your questions out in front of you, the ones for um, chapters 10 through 14. Okay, so the last we left, Frankie and Mike, they had gone shopping with Mr. Howard, and they had been treated very badly in the store. And so now they have very nice clothes, and they're on their way back, okay, to the house. On the way back to the trolley stop, Frankie skipped ahead of Mike and Mr. Howard and stopped in front of a shop window. He turned wide-eyed, waving for them to hurry. Mike jogged to him. What is it, kid? It's them, he said, pointing to a large poster displayed in a window of Wilkinson's Music Emporium. It's the Harmonica Wizards. Frankie pressed his nose on the glass. Mike looked up at the poster of over 60 boys in military-style uniforms, capes, and plumed hats. A tiny man wearing a red apron stepped from the shop. His gray mustache had been waxed into an old-fashioned handlebar, curling up on both ends. Good day, gentlemen, he nodded toward the poster. Aren't they something? The famous Philadelphia Harmonica Band. Are you boys going to enter the contest? Still plenty of time. Sir, what's all this? asked Mr. Howard. Citywide competition in August. Thousands of children taking lessons all over Philadelphia. Lots of prizes, including musical instruments. It's an audition of sorts. Top five winners are invited to join the band and travel all over. They have their own women's auxiliary, raising money for uniforms, finding homes for boys to board in, even sending them to college. Frankie nodded as if he were an expert. We were going to try out so we could get out of the orphanage, but we don't have to now because we got adopted. Well, that's wonderful. Doesn't mean you still can't enter for the fun of it, said Mr. Wilkinson. But you got to have the official harmonica and you got to be 10 years old, except if you're a mascot, see? Frankie pointed to the young boy in the poster. That's right. The youngster is a novelty and only plays with the band when it's in town. Doesn't travel with them. Band's got all sorts of rules about such things. But he's sure a crowd pleaser in that uniform, he winked at Frankie. And you're right about the harmonica. Has to be the Honer Marine Band in the key of C. I just received a shipment from the warehouse yesterday and they're going like hotcakes. Only 65 cents each. He pulled a striped handkerchief from his apron pocket and began blotting his forehead. Speaking of hotcakes, this weather is a steamy kitchen. The heat has about got me beat. Frankie looked up at Mr. Howard. Mrs. Pennyweather took away our harmonicas Granny bought for us. Mr. Howard smiled. Mr. Wilkinson, I don't think we're interested in the contest, but two harmonicas might just be the ticket. Right this way, said Mr. Wilkinson. He opened the shop door and a bell on the frame jingled. Mr. Howard and Frankie followed Mr. Wilkinson to the counter near the register. There are kittens underfoot, so watch your steps, said Mr. Wilkinson, three of them somewhere in the store. Mike walked down the narrow center aisle, mindful of where he stepped and savoring the smell of bow rosin, leather cases, and wood polish. His eyes couldn't look fast enough at all the instruments that crowded every available space. Trumpets in a glass case, cellos propped at attention, violins suspended from the ceiling, crash cymbals and snare drums, a bass drum on a pedestal. It reminded him of the shop where Granny used to take him to buy sheet music. Isn't it wonderful, she'd say? Music is just waiting to escape from all these instruments. He smiled, remembering how he'd always expected to see a string of black notes fleeing from the bell of a tuba or a trombone. Frankie ran toward him, holding a calico kitten in one hand and a new harmonica in the other. Look, Mike, it comes with an instruction booklet with songs. Listen, he ran his mouth over the harmonica. Doesn't it sound grand? I took the last one by the register, but Mr. Wilkinson said for you to go to the back counter and get one from the carton he just opened. Frankie wandered back to where Mr. Howard and Mr. Wilkinson stood together talking. Mike worked his way back to the to the back of the store until he reached a counter in front of a curtain storeroom. On top sat a big open carton filled with slim cases. Mike lifted one and opened it. Inside, 12 individual boxes lay in a row, each imprinted with a photo of the United States Marine Band. 
The last box on the bottom caught his eye. The blue border seemed brighter than the rest. The red lettering bolder, bolder. The photograph of the marine band sharper. When he lifted the box, he could have sworn he heard a chord erupt, like a high-pitched chime. He glanced around. It must have been Mr. Wilkinson's cash register. Mike opened the box, picked up the harmonica, and turned it over. He noticed a small, red, hand-painted M on one edge. He lifted the harmonica to his lips, ran the scale, and then played the last six notes of America the Beautiful. During the pause, after the final note and before his next breath, all the instruments in the shop struck a long, echoing chord. He spun around, his eyes darting to the motionless instruments. No one else was around. Everything was quiet. It was stuffy in the shop, and he felt lightheaded. He swiped at his brow, now beaded with perspiration, and put the harmonica back in its box. He clutched it in his hand as he headed toward the front. Okay, your first question for today says, how does Mike's pick of the harmonicas relate to part one? So the harmonica that he picked, what is similar to the harmonica that we saw in the first book or in the first part with Friedrich? Okay. He was escorted by a chorus of sounds, the hoots of clarinets, the swish swish of the snare drum, the plucking of violin strings, and the deep strum of the cello. When he passed the trumpets, a fanfare blasted. He glanced over his shoulder. Everything looked the same. Had Granny been right? Was the music escaping? Or was this all some clever trick of Mr. Wilkinson's? A kitten followed him, pawing at his ankles. With each step, the space around him felt more crowded and the air thicker. I've already paid, said Mr. Howard when Mike reached him. I see you chose a harmonica. Mike nodded. Mr. Wilkinson winked at him. I always say the instrument chooses the musician instead of the other way around. He nodded to Mr. Howard. Thank you for your business. As they walked out and the door swung shut behind him, the bell on the frame fluttered like a giddy piccolo. Outside, Mike rubbed his forehead. Maybe the heat had him beat, too. Even the harmonica felt warm in his hand. He leaned toward Frankie. You hear anything funny in there? No, but guess what? Mr. Howard said Mr. Potter is the best harmonica player he's ever heard in his entire life, and tomorrow's his day off, and maybe he can teach us some songs. All the way to the trolley stop, Mike and Frankie played the harmonicas. Mike sounded different from Frankie's. His had a tone he couldn't explain. It seemed older and rounder somehow. As he played songs he already knew by heart, his steps became more buoyant and his heart filled with something he had not felt for a long while. Was it happiness? The trolley stopped, bell clanging. Mr. Howard smiled and said, Come on, boys, time to head home. Frankie grabbed Mike's hand and squeezed it. Mike looked at the kids' smiling faces and squeezed in return. Mr. Howard had said home. Maybe this time they could catch a break and everything would go right. Okay, now look at the next question. It says, what is important about the word home at the end of chapter 12? So look at this next section, this last section again. Why does that mean something special to Mike, that word home? Okay, we're going to continue to the next chapter. Mr. Potter could make the harmonica sound like a train on a track, a baby crying, or rain falling in the wind. Sunday afternoon, Mike and Frankie sat on a bench under a shade tree next to the Potter's cottage, hypnotized by his playing. Mike couldn't take his eyes from Mr. Potter's hands or his mouth and the way his head swayed with the music. He recognized familiar melodies, but they were peppered with repeating rhythms. The sound seemed to transport him to another place in time, someplace ancient and earthy. The beat started and stopped, questioned and answered. Mike had never heard anything like it before. When Mr. Potter paused, Mike asked, What is that sound? Mr. Potter nodded and grinned. Kind of catches you, doesn't it? Called the blues. Why? asked Frankie. Ever heard someone say they're feeling blue? asked Mr. Potter. Means sad or they got the melancholies about life. So blues music is about all the trials and tribulations people got in their hearts from living. It's about what folks want but don't have. 
Blues is a song begging for its life. Okay, now, your next question on the page says, what feelings are associated with the blues? So I want you to think about this last paragraph really helps us with that, okay? Melancholy is a sadness. It's a really good word for when you're feeling just kind of down. Like, you can't really explain it. It's not really sad. You're just kind of, you're just down. But the music doesn't sound sad all the time, said Mike. No, the songs are full of something else, too, said Mr. Potter. That's the thing. No matter how much you don't have, there's always so much more life to be had. So no matter how much sadness is in a song, there's equal amount of maybe things will get better someday soon. Can you make any song the blues, asked Mike. Not always, but you can make most sound bluesy. Frank, Frankie laughed. Bluesy, that's funny. Means you can give most any song the flavor of the blues. Mr. Potter put his harmonica to his lips and played Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. It was the same melody their mom used to sing, but with repeating phrases. At the end, Mr. Potter seemed to goad the song into wailing. Goad means kind of push or move. How did you do that, asked Mike. Easy, Mr. Potter grinned. You take the tune and break it up, then do over some of the lines, then sprinkle in some grit from your insides. You play the song like you're testifying to the feelings you hold in your heart. Happy, sad, angry. Mike, you follow what I do. He played two chords. Mike repeated them. He played a note bending it. Mike copied him. Mr. Potter made each phrase different from the last. Back and forth they went. First Mr. Potter and then Mike. Short notes like words, followed by longer phrases like full sentences. Then entire paragraphs of music as if the two of them were having a conversation. When they were done, Frankie clapped. Now me, he said. Mr. Parter started over, making the phrases simpler. After Frankie caught on, Mike joined in. In the shade of the tree, with the sounds of the three harmonicas talking to one another, and all that had happened to them in the last few days, Mike dared to let another sliver of happiness creep into his heart. Mrs. Potter called to Frankie and Mike from the back door of the main house and waved them over. Frankie ran ahead. Mr. Potter pointed at Mike's harmonica. That is something special. Got a quality I never heard before. Mike nodded. I, I feel different when I play it. Do you remember when um, Friedrich said with the harmonica in his pocket it made him feel brave and not as scared about what the other kids thought? Mr. Potter smiled. Sometimes an instrument does that to a person, makes the world seem brighter with more possibilities. Mike understood what he meant. He'd felt it. He held out the harmonica, pointing to the tiny scroll-like M on the pear wood edge that he'd noticed yesterday. What's this mean, Mr. Potter? I don't know. Never saw such a thing. Frankie's have it? Mike shook his head. No, I checked. Probably put there by its maker. That harmonica isn't the only thing special. You got a natural talent. Mrs. Potter told me about your piano playing. Now I know what she was now I know what she was going on about. Wait here. Mr. Potter went into the cottage. A few minutes later he came back and handed Mike a thick book of music with harmonica tabs. You can borrow this a while. It'll pique your interest just fine. You gonna come back tomorrow and jam with me some more? Mike nodded. Thank you, yes, sir. Slowly, Mike made his way toward the house, playing the songs he'd just learned. When a movement caught his eye, he glanced up at a second-story window. Mrs. Sturbridge stood watching him, but before he could raise his hand to wave, she disappeared and the draperies plunged closed. He hadn't had an opportunity to apologize for playing the piano yesterday. Was she still upset about that, or was it something else? Mrs. Sturbridge's strange behavior continued. For two weeks, they hardly saw her. Mrs. Potter kept them busy with the schedule of meals and playtime and chores. Mr. Potter let Frankie follow him around like a puppy. Mr. Howard came every few evenings and ate dinner with them, staying after to play catch on the lawn or a game of checkers on the porch. He took them to the park on weekends. She never joined them. Mike tried to tell himself it didn't matter, that just being together was enough for him and Frankie. 
but he saw how the kid's eyes followed Mrs. Sturbridge when she whisked past them. He felt Frankie's longing to be part of a family again, and sometimes in his heart of hearts, Mike even dared to wish the same for himself. He took comfort in the blues. He practiced as much as he could with Mr. Potter, working through the music book and making each song bluesy. Every time he played, he felt buoyed, lifted up, and full of possibility as if he were riding on the shoulders of some unknown power. He could sense something optimistic in his heart, making his music shine from the inside out. In the hours between playing, though, he felt confused and unsettled. Something about being on Amaryllis Drive was rotten. That was where they were staying. The night before the 4th of July, Mike sat on the side of his bed, flipping through the pages of the book Mr. Potter had given him and studying the music. He started at the beginning with Good Night Ladies, followed by For He's a Jolly Good Fellow and Oh Susanna. Frankie came into the bedroom and climbed up next to him. Play me a song, please. Mike obliged, easing into my old Kentucky home. That was good, said Frankie, his eyes already drooping. Mike, do you think tomorrow... His eyes closed and his forehead wrinkled as if he were wishing hard for something. Mike didn't need Frankie to finish the question. Every night he asked the same ones. Do you think tomorrow she will spend time with us? Or maybe let us eat in the dining room with her instead of in the kitchen? Mike reached over and smoothed Frankie's forehead. Do you think she'll take us to see the fireworks at the park because of 4th of July? Frankie murmured. Especially since Mr. Howard is out of town. Sure, kid, whispered Mike. Go to sleep now. Maybe tomorrow will be the day. Okay, now this whole book is talking about music. We had the importance of music and Friedrich and his father and even among their family when Elizabeth played the piano and there were some really good memories there. And this, this chapter we have Mike and with his grandmother and his mother and the connection there. I want you to tell me um, how how music can be special or how it can be helpful. What um, Give me something about music. Music can be helpful by, music can be meaningful for someone because um, how is, because music could seem like it's just something that is not really necessary. How is music important okay music is important because and think about think about what mike was doing and mr potter was doing when they were playing and what the blues required of them okay so give me a good sentence about music music's important because or it's uh, meaningful because or it helps people because all right Okay, we'll get to the next one.